OK. Part two here, so. The idea about what is the shem of the Elohim revealing himself to Yohanan in the book of Revelation. Some people say the one who says I'm the Aleph Tav was actually Yeshua. But if you read closely, the vo there's a voice that spoke to him. Claiming to be the Aleph Tav and he turned around to see and then he sees Yeshua standing there. Who also says I'm the Aleph and the Tav, the firstborn of creation. It's like. And I've heard people say, no, he's, he's not the firstborn. He was always, he was eternal. Well, that concept of the eternalness. I've also heard was determined built as a doctrine because there's another place where he's getting baptized and the voice from heaven says this day I have begotten you and it's like I thought he was the eternally begotten and it's like oh man what I'm saying is that there's this idea that you can hold mutually exclusive concepts in your brain at the same time it's called cognitive dissonance thinking and the word dissonant means counter or opposed was he eternal or was he this day begotten well the church had to figure out a way to reconcile that and they come up with this idea called the trinity and then even i i, I forget who it was but some archbishop or somebody was just asked you're the smartest of all the smart guys what is that trinity how does it work could you please explain it and he says no it's a mystery you just got to believe it it's like just believe it because it doesn't fit, but we're going to tell you that's what it is so that you just OK, so you have to allow your mind and, and, a, and a bunch of theological things are like this. You just have to tell your mind, I don't know and I don't care. That's what it is, and so I'll just believe that's what it is. Try to figure out and you'll go nuts, so don't even try to figure it out. Just believe it. OK, that's that's the way the religion is built. But for me to say then that, no, wait a minute, this Aleph Tav is the word. Aleph through Tav, the Aleph Bet, is the word that Elohim created, John 1, John chapter 1, verse 1. And that word was very specifically designed, built, crafted, invented by Elohim. And then that word was used to create the creation and then that word became flesh and is the man we call Yahusha. Who even Nicodemus Nicodemus said, we know you come from heaven because nobody can do the things you do. So he's not a regular earthling comes from heaven. Does that mean he was the eternal one? Well, that's the church doctrine. But was he from eternity past? Or was he the first born of creation? Now, that gets into doctrinal disputes that I'm not trying to engage, but I'm just saying that at some point with any train of thought, you're going to bump into a conundrum that's impossible and then you're left with just believe. So when the book of Revelation talks about two other occasions, I think it's Revelation 12 and another place it says the, the, the attributes of this particular people group are those who have kept the commandments of Elohim and the testimony of Yeshua. It's like, OK, I could look in the Aramaic and say, how is that written? But what's the testimony of Yeshua? That means I bear witness that I believe in Jesus. That's the way I was taught that it means. But what is the testimony of Yeshua? Read Revelation 3 right there. Yeshua is standing there and says, I am the one who was dead and now I'm alive. I was the one who died. Well, that's the mortality of Adam. And yet I live because he empowered me. My father empowered me to take up my life. But then there's another place that says he didn't take it up. He was restored to life by Yahweh, by his father. So I've heard people say Jesus is the father. It, it's this convoluted and nobody that I've ever heard can actually say, let me, let me lay it down and spread it out so you can identify the pieces of this puzzle. Well, yeah, there is. There's the Aleph bet. Those are the pieces of the puzzle. But I don't know anybody else who's talking about this. So what I'm saying is that anybody who ponders this contemplation of the Aleph bet, that's what it is we're dealing with. 
There's 22 pieces of the puzzle, and the relationship between Yeshua and Yahuwah is somehow in these 22 letters. What is Adam compared to Elohim? It's somehow in these 22 letters. Your own consciousness, your own sanity, your own life is somehow in these 22 letters. All that it create that exists in creation is in these 22 letters. So the, the gospel narrative, the story, the Haggadah of the Mashiach is in the 22 letters. Aleph, I am, I will. Coming from the heavens to bet, incorporate, become material in the corporeal universe. That's the beginning of the story right there. And when Yeshua, just as he's leaving in the end, last couple of verses of Matthew, I'm telling you, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. And then he disappears. Reshin Tov means all authority has been given to me. He was showing us by that sentence that it's by saying, he sat down on the mountain, Matthew 5, and opened his mouth and taught them. Open mouth is Pezotti, so I can zone right into Pezotti and say, wow, that was a cryptic code. Who do you say I am? Is in disguise. The word bet gimel dalit means in disguise. I came in disguise to the material universe, gimling through the dalit of the hay, you know, being born of the pelvis of the woman as the man, the vav, who would be identified, distinguished, pointed to, and put to death by the weapon, Zion, Havav Zion, behold this man. It's all, it's all embedded in these letters. So what I'm saying is, if it wasn't the study of these letters, then in Revelation 2 and 3, and even the other places, you know, 6 and so forth, but especially where he's talking to the seven churches, Revelation 2 and 3, you have guarded my word and not denied my name. What name? Jesus? That wasn't his name. Yahusha. What does that mean? Yahweh saves his people. Nobody's denying that. Is that the Shem that he's concerned with? Shem is the same as fame, renown, and reputation. Well, your fame, renown, and reputation, that's your identity. The word spelled Zion Hey, or Zion Vav Hey, is to identify identity. Identical, Zion Hey, Vav Tav Yod. A corner or an angle, it's like, don't bump the, your elbow on the table, boom, it's like, or even your elbow itself is a Zion Vav Yod Tav, Zoit. Hey, just so you know, hey, Zion, hey, means to dream or rave. Hey, Zion, Zion, motion, shift, deviation, drift, or displacement. So, hey, Zion, Zion, you take the second letter and you multiply it, make it the third. Shouldn't that to be more of uh, whatever that was? If hey, Zion is, boy, this is dreamy. This is like, woo, this is ethereal. But if hey, Zion, Zion is to displace, but Zion Hay is to be the thing, then something about the Zion is either the thing or not the thing. It's either the reality or the displacement from the reality. See, the, again, in the Hebrew, uh, the concept of a word or a letter is itself and its opposite. Hey Zion, Yod Vav Nun, Hazion, daydreaming, vision, dreamlike. Zion Yod Tav is the word olive. So I could say Shem and Debar, name and word, Ma Zit. What? What is this? Why is Zion Yod Tav the word for olive? I don't recall seeing an olive tree in bloom or olive tree with fully fruit. I've seen orange trees and fruit and apple trees and I'm going to guess that an olive, olive tree looks the same. I could look it up. And, but to say, whoa, hey, look, there it is. Well, boy, see, when an olive tree, if that's your crop, that's that's money in the bank. That's that's resources. Adorned, beautified, spectacular glory. Somehow Yeshua being, ha, we're going to mock this guy, put a crown of thorns on his head. They were mocking, but they were also glorifying at the same time. To rip him to shreds with the Roman weapons, the, the cat of nine tail, the flail with bits of pottery and metal that ripped 
the flesh apart, they were also adorning him with weapons. Zion Yod, Zion Aleph Tav. To contemplate the significance of that goes beyond just the narrative story, just the narrative story, the passion of the Christ, the, the movie that Mel Gibson made, to realize that it was written into the script. You have labored for my name's sake. What name? It's not just those letters of yod Hey vav Hey. He causes to exist. Causes what to exist? Hey vav Hey, the fifth letter, the sixth letter, then the fifth letter again. Aleph Hey yod Hey, the fifth letter, the tenth letter, and the fifth letter. The only reason why the letters mean existence is because of what those letters are within the confine of the 22 letter expanse. So he would have had to invent the 22 letter expanse, designating which letter follows which and what means what and how they work together so that he could pick out the four letters which were his name. So again, you'd have to have this collection of the 22 first. The works he said to do have something to do with these letters. So for me to try to analyze what the meaning of the letters of the alphabet are and say, where is the works of Elohim? The letter Samic, which could be a tree shape, could be a skeleton shape, could be a menorah shape, lit, lit by seven candles, but each one has three cups and four cups. That's the 22, it could be 22 flames on seven branches. What does that mean? You have labored for my name's sake. Labor doing what? One of the words for labor is ayin bet dalit, obed, obedience, to work, to, to put an effort, to tan hides. It's also the word for worship. I, I could look at the Aramaic and see what was that written, but if I was just going to read the English and plug in what the Hebrew words, I could say you have worshipped according to the regard of my name. Worship the regard of my name. For my name's sake. Worshipped according to Lamed. Lamed is the prefix meaning according to my name. And if my name is where I'm at with all these things, then I could, and if I see the 22 letters is where he's at, that's his name, then this entire effort of trying to determine what do these letters mean? How does it honor and glorify and adorn him? How are these 22 letters the bejewelment? 22? Well, he, remember he talks about the tree of life in the garden who bears a dozen different fruits throughout the year. Well, these 22 letters is almost like a tree with 22 types of fruit. I saw a picture of a down, I think it was down in Arizona or out in the desert of California anyway. Um, a guy who grafted on various citrus fruits, grapefruit, lemon, orange, tangerine, tangelo, all in the same trunk. It's kind of interesting, the one tree bearing all these different uh, types of fruits. Same kind of thing. You have concerned yourself and labored as an act of worship of my name, my word. My instruction, my my revealing myself, my adornment, my bejewelment, my radiant glory. If it wasn't looking at these things of, of the Aleph bat of how is every one of his instructions is not just don't steal, don't kill, don't don't eat cheese on your hamburger. For David to say, I love the Lomiting of Aleph? 
No, I love your law. I love your Torah. Why? Verse 18, he says, open my eyes that I can see the nephalot, the, the paleo, the hidden wonders. I know you've got hidden wonders in there, but they're hidden within the words. What are they? There's something about, and then David goes on to describe in Psalm 119. If I regard your Torah, it gives me wisdom, it strengthens me, it, there's life there. There's, See, David goes through Psalm 119 and says, this is what it does for me, but he never says what it is. That's one reason I, I think it would be good to go back through, spend a few weeks going through Psalm 119, trying to decipher what is the it of the Torah. But here's my point. If the it of the Torah is that the law, the Torah, see the word chok, chet kuf, would probably be better translated law. Mitzvot, mem zadi vav, Tav, mem is a prefix, vav, tav, plural suffix, zadi, vav, zadi itself, the, the sprout, the flourish, the blossom, the zadi, the sp- is the zadi vav is the word command. Zadi vav, vav, tav, I believe is the word that means to be under command, like a crew of the ship on the team doing what he said. Find out how to do something. Matzah, mem zadi, hey, mem zadi aleph. Find out how to do what he said. That's the Zadi. Zion, Zadi Yod Vav Nun is those who are doing what he said. Zion. What did he say? If what he said in the Old Testament was do this and don't do that, okay, <laughs> the Old Testament's pretty big. What are all those other words? You have guarded my word. You got 10 commandments, you got 613 laws, according to the rabbis of do this, don't do that. Okay, is that the word that he was talking about guarding? You've guarded my 613 commandments. What are all those other words? Bible stories. We read about David and Goliath. Is that one of the words that he commended his people for guarding? History of Gideon, is that what he wanted to have us guard? See, if I tried to take all his words and boil them down to the nitty gritty of here's the core essence of what he wants us to do. Even the Ten Commandments, boil that down and you have Ve'ahavta et Yahweh Elheka. You will love Yahweh your Elohim. The Aleph Tav is missing. It's not there translated in English. With all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And so the words for heart, soul, and strength, if you boil those down and say, well, what are those actual words? The word heart, Lamed Bet, or Lamed Bet Bet. You look in the dictionary, it means inflamed, interest, Affection set ablaze where we get the word lava, L-A-V-A, like molten rock in a volcano. It means to ravish the heart, encouraged, fascinated, strengthen mind, will to be understanding. Bet bet is a gateway. Lamed means toward or belonging to, belonging to the gateway. But he says, love, love the Lord your God, love Yahweh your Elohim with all your heart. He's telling us to do that proactively on purpose. So that doesn't mean, I just don't find it of interest. I just don't happen to like that. He's basically saying, force yourself or yield yourself or determine for yourself to do this. Did anybody ever tell us that we can aim and guide our heart? I just don't like this. Oh, I find that interesting. Oh, I just, oh, hey, I find that curious. Oh, I'm just... uh, Gee, I don't know why I uh, like that collection. I just do. Thou shalt love the Lord your God. It doesn't say thou shalt. It says ve'ahavta 
Ahav, Aleph, Hey, Bet is the word love. Aleph, Hey, Bet, Hey. Aleph, Hey, Bet, Tav, the Tav makes it you. Thou shalt, there's no thou shalt. They and, and love, loving. There's no thou shalt. They ahavta Aleph, Tav. They ahavta et. Yahweh el Heka, Yahweh your Elohim. Ve kol with all lavev ka. La, the kaf suffix means you, lavav. So if it means inflamed interest, affection, set ablaze, ravishing your heart, then you look at the derivatives of lion bet. Lamed bet yod aleph means the word lion. Well, aleph resh yod is also lion. I think there's another word that means it, like the animal, the lion. Lamed bet yod aleph aleph suffix my i gotta be like a lion lamed bet lion lamed bet is bloom or blossom well that's like zadika so i must determine that i will blossom or have just like you have an affection for seeing a bouquet of flowers or hey the daisies are blooming or hey the mountain lilies are Boom, they just, and there they are, look. The day lilies, only there for a day and then it disappears. Or it, it's like there's some flowers, like a, what, what they call a uh, super bloom in California. The hillsides happens only once in a while, depending on the weather conditions. But man, the whole hillside is like a carpet of various colors. Choose to be. Lamed bet noon, that's Laban, like Jacob's father-in-law, but it also means to launder or to make bricks, make something white, but it also means purified, clarified, and elucidated, which is the same synonym as Chet Vav Resh, the word Chor, that we looked at, that they made their robes white. To make them white, make their robes white, and robes is their well, there's three or four words for clothing. One is bet gimel dalit. How do you make your attire white? If it means purified, clarified, and elucidated, and inflaming your heart, blossoming lamed bet vav bet lavuv is understanding. It's also cordial. Well, cord like cord d'Alene means heart. So cord d'Alene means the heart of the lion at the city up there in Idaho. The heart of the lion, cord d'Alene, is literally what lavav then can mean. Have, as it were, a lion's heart about Aleph, hey, bet, hey. Hey, bet is the word to give. Aleph, hey, bet. Aleph, I will, I will give. So what's translated, love the Lord your God with all your heart, is really... I will give my heart to Yahuwah my Elohim by proactively inducing, inducing from within a fascination, inflamed interest of his stuff, his words. The word nefesh, nafshaka, Again, the cough suffix means your noon is a prefix of uh, like a lightning bolt of turn this on. But Peshin, my mom used to say, ah, pish tosh, pish tosh. What does that mean? Where did you get that? It's Hebrew. Peshin, pish means to spring about like folly, like some little kid who has no ego of what do you, you know what you look like? You look like some stupid little. <laughs> That's literally the word for. Pish, push, pay vavshin, strong, increase, scatter, spread, proliferate, disperse, expansion. That's kind of like pezadi. That's like an, this explosion. It's like Israel getting scattered across the face of the earth. Noon peishin, nefesh, is animation, but it's also the opposite of animation. It means to be idle, rest, repose, or to be refreshed and enlivened because you're resting. So nefesh technically is keep the Sabbath day. It'll revive you so that you can jump about and enjoy life the other six days. 
Nefesh also means in the dictionary soul, self. So nefesh is the concept of self. I, I happen to see this thing on the internet, it's talking about dimensions. So there's three dimensions of space, and then the fourth dimension generally regarded, regarded as time. The fifth dimension, well, in day five, he put fish in the sea and birds in the air. Day four, like time, sun, moon, and stars in the sky. Fish in the sea and birds in the air, that's kind of like demons and angels in a way. If we live on the terrestrial landmass, then what's below us and above us? Metaphorically, demons and angels, if such a thing exists. But the, the idea, this other person was saying, oh, the fifth dimension is spirit. Well, then what's the sixth dimension? Self. Self? The concept of self, a dimension of self, self-awareness, beingness. I wouldn't have necessarily guessed that, but if that's day six and day the six letters of Vav, and I'm now comparing the pay with the Vav because that's just, what does the pay got to do with self? And if you noon the pay or enliven, spark, spark the mouth, noon Vav pay, sieve, sift, Winnow, examine closely, wait, elevation, panorama, landscape, treetop swaying. I'm just saying that that when you get a concept and you try to plug it into this Mishkan pattern, the alphabet pattern, the spelling of words pattern, pay is a mouth where you get breath, lining up with the article in the Mishkan of the altar of incense. Prayers of the saints. Speaking. Communication. Where the heart of the self is. What, do justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your Elohim. Samak I and pay. So walking humbly with your Elohim. Prayer. Worship. Meditation. Contemplating what he said. Having a heart for his stuff, to blow, to breathe, expand broadness, to spread out living being, all that's nefesh. To love him with all your soul, as it's translated, does that mean intellectually thinking? But yet, some people I've been told, that's bad, that's wrong, don't do that, that's earthly, carnal. No, it's not, it's what he said to do. For the self, for David to say, oh, how I love thy law, it's my meditation all the day, is loving Yahweh your Elohim with all your soul, your nefesh, to intentionally meditate. The word Haggah is meditate, which means to navigate, which is to get in a boat and just kind of cruise, hence the word navy, navigation. The word may ode, M-A-D, Mem Aleph Dalit, where we get madly. In the dictionary, means strength, very, greatly, exceedingly, abundance, or cooked in steam. Okay, put all those three things together. Thou shalt love, Ve'ahavta, Aleph Tav. Is it the Aleph Tav of Yahweh? Why is that Aleph Tav there? And again, if I'm saying the Aleph Tov is this concept of the truth, if this Aleph Tov is the first and last beginning and the end of the 22 letters as a package deal, then this is the word that contains his name, his word, the truth. It's known as the Aleph Tov. To open it up as a story, it looks like the gospel narrative of Yeshua. The, the stuff that's in there is what's built the entire universe. If you take the letters and spell commands that came out of his mouth, it looks like Torah law. Do this, don't do that. Why? That's what works. Then this notion, this concept that there's a conflict between grace and law, Either you're under the law or you're under grace. And if you're under grace, you're not under the law. And if you're under the law, you're not under grace. 
is a bogus phantom argument. But how many times have I heard that discussed and argued? Are we under the law? No, we're under grace. Are you under grace? So you should say, no, we're, we have to do what the law says. It's a fake argument. It doesn't exist because the law isn't the law and grace isn't grace. What we have is this is the way the universe works. And if you in your Adamic human corruption break the law, instead of being dead forever, lost forever, by his chen, his grace, he'll welcome you back and say, don't do it again. You better not do it again. If you do do it again, you're going to get hurt again. If you, if you keep doing it, you'll abominate yourself and bring death upon yourself. Because that's the way the universe is built. It's not a question of mercy or law. And anybody who says the law is an imposed set of rules that we get punished for breaking has completely misrepresented what's going on. The law is, if you guys eat this stuff, you're ingesting toxic poison and your physicality and maybe mentality and maybe to some degree spirituality will be compromised. Harm done to it. So don't do that. Do this instead. Don't work on the seventh day. That's a positive command. Honor your mother and father. That's a positive command. Don't dishonor them. There's the negatory. Do not dishonor your mother and father. Yeah, but what if they deserve it? Don't do it. That's the law. Why? What was David trying to see of value in the instructions? He's not looking for God's grace to say, come on, David, you're a good friend of mine. I'll let you go. I'll, I won't hold you to account. Jesus is going to come in the future and die on the cross and pay for your sins so you can do all the sinning you want and it just doesn't matter. That's not true. That is not the grace that he offers. So if that's the grace that we're being told is the opposite of the law, the whole thing is bogus. The whole thing is a distortion. The whole thing is a satanic diversion. Shock and awe, smoke and mirrors, to get us off the track of even thinking about What should we do? How should we live? So what I was talking about last week saying, for us to synchronize with the truth, so things blossom, so things flourish, health, wealth, sanity, the weather, nature, our enemies leave us alone. Why? Because that's the way the universe is built. And besides that, he will push it more so. And so here's the interesting thing. Scripture seems to validate your predisposition or your predetermined expectation of what it says. If you think the law is bad punishment imposed on us. And as you read the Bible, it's like, yep, 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 yep. That's what it says. Look at here and there. And Jesus died on the cross to save us from having to do the law. Yep. That's, that's the way it all reads. But if you think, no, there's nothing wrong with the law. The law is a good thing, a positive thing with blessing. If we do it and you start reading, that's what you'll read. If you read the Bible as a Jew, you'll see that. If you read it as a Christian, you'll see that. And it's like, well, wait a minute. What's it really say? Here's, here's, here's my uh, consideration. If you know these 22 letters, you know what the value of each of the 22 is, then you can read the Bible and see that in there as if it's proof, as if it's validating that this is like the, the study. This is the thing he wants us to regard. And when he says, you have guarded my name and you have guarded my word, you've attended to my word, you've, you've navigated and, and guarded and, and studied and elucidated who I am by what I said, 
Shem and Debar, the same. It's all in the study of the words. Therefore, those who have made their robes white have done this. Those who are victorious, our Elohim reigns and salvation is his bailiwick, his jurisdiction, his dominion is the salvation. That's this stuff. And he identifies himself as the Elohim be, be robed in the Moedim, his robe of orientation, of ornamentation, his robe of kingly grandeur is the Moedim. And it's the Moedim which hold the reference of what these letters mean right there between the letters Chet and Zadi. Also, which can be read as the place of the grave of the crucifixion and the resurrection from the grave. This is the whole Yahusha thing. I mean, to see this is like, if that's his identity, then for Yeshua to come and run this gauntlet story, I'm only doing what I see my father doing. I'm here in his name. That's his name. His name happens to be the story, not just for the letters, but all 22 letters. And if you see that Yeshua is the guy in the 22 letters, then, then, then this group making their robes white in the clear explanation of these things, they're not Jews because the Jews have no regard of Yahushua. But they're not Christians because you have to know the Moedim if you're going to retain his Shem and his word and his word says, keep these Moedim, then, that, then the people wearing the white robes there are not Christians. Well, then who are they? What are they doing? They're guarding his word and his Shem. And the instructions of his word, besides the Ten Commandments, is keep these Moedim because it's the culture of the kingdom and it speaks of his Zion Aleph Tov identity. And when he talks about his name, it's what distinguishes him from any other Elohim. I know Zulti. There is no other Elohim. There is no other. But the reality is retained by the Lamading, the instructions, the Torah. As he said, Tav Yod can be said is, as I have said. It's the suffix that meaning I will or I have. I will, Aleph prefix, Tav Yod, my suffix. I, I there I did say, what did he say? To study these words, to study these letters, to do what you study, to keep the Shabbat, to keep the Moedim, to navigate, to ponder, to meditate on his words. It looks to me in Revelation 2 and 3, that's what he's looking for. And then as you read in the other chapters, that's what the people are doing. If you look at the meaning of the letter resh, well, it means exalted man or head or it's drawn almost like a flag or, you know, a mast with a something you notice, a flag in the distance. Oh, there it is, the mountain. The mountain here in Portland, Oregon is known for Mount Hood. Way off in the distance, it's shown as the backdrop to the city. Hey, Resh, the, the, the mountain peak. Kuf Vav, hope, expectation, this zone. So the Vav is a suffix meaning it or they or he or referring to the thing. So Kuf Vav is a way to read what does Kuf mean. Zadi Vav is the way to read what does Zadi mean. Nun Vav. Uh, nun Vav Hey means to dwell or abode, pasture, meadow, beautiful, comely, adorn, praise, glorify. That's Nun Vav Hey. But Nun Vav Vav Nun is degenerate or deteriorate. Nun Vav Nun, doesn't that mean fish? Multiply, sprout, increase, or waste away. Again, the thing in the opposite. 
So what is nooning? Draw, I draw it like a lightning bolt. Some people draw it like a sprout, a seed with a little growth coming out of it. Putting something into an action of life in either you're going to multiply and increase or you're going to degenerate and deteriorate. Well, that's a picture of the blessing or the curse. The noon is neither one or the other. It's the action of something happening. In other words, it's non-static. So if nooning just means something's happening, either the blessing or the curse, but noon follows mem, like a fish jumping out of the water, like a baby being born. Lamed Mem Noon, teach and learn the authority of the instructions. Cough Lamed, cough looks like an open hand, but if you hold your hand sideways, it looks, you write text in lines. That's just what we do. So I think of the cough being lines of instruction of the Torah, the authority, letter Lamed, shaped like a separate staff, that according to how we have a heart for it, Mem, Lavav Ka, Naf Shaka, Meo Deka, Noon happens. So when he says, love the Lord God, ve'ahavta et Yahweh el heka, ve'ahavta, give the regard. Aleph, hey, bet, Aleph is I will, I am. So that's me speaking, my consciousness giving, hey, bet, hey, I'm going to give love by having an inflamed interest, affection set ablaze, Ravish the heart to be of understanding the blossoming, the blooming of the anim with animation of this expanse between Aleph and Tav of his Ruach. My Ruach then will synchronize with his Ruach. He's the Elohim of life. Only good can come of that. Only life and light and lavish can come out of doing that. So last week saying it's like this certain frequency being hit and the sand turns into a cymatic geometry. It has to. Talked about the word Rahab, wide, broad, spacious, roomy, synonym with Ruach. Well, Resh, Chet, Pei, Rachaf, move gently, hover, fly, flutter, brood. See, the interesting thing, when you're looking at the dictionary, you're looking at Resh, Chet, Resh, Vav, Chet, Ruach, then, oh, there's Resh, Chet, Bet. I'm looking for Resh, Chet. What other word, Resh, Yod, Het, Reek, has to do with fragrance or smell or something wafting on the wind. But Resh, Chet, Pei, Merachef. Well, that's like the spirit of Elohim, Merachefet. Mem, Reshet, Pei, Tov. Reshet, Pei, Tov, it says, mean pollen. Why? Because when the trees are pollinating, I mean, there's this little fine green dust everywhere. Well, it spreads out. So these concepts, Merachefet, translated oscillate resonance vibration. In Genesis 1, verse 2, this, the Ruach of Elohim, Merachefet, al Pene. On, my, on the face of the, on the surface of the water, it, well, it vibrated, it oscillated, it fluttered, hovered, quivered. Well, that's sending out vibrations. So, so there's something about this study of vibration, resonance, frequency. Well, that's voice. What did he say? What is it? What is this cymatic pattern? So I'm trying to take all these ideas that look like they're new age or science or some sort of shaman, this or that, and matrix energetics, that Richard Bartlett guy. And it's like, you know, the truth is the truth. And if these guys you see on the internet talking about stuff or people from other generations, seldom if ever do they include Yahuwah's stuff. Yahuwah is reality. Yahuwah is word and Shem. But if I say yod He vav He, why those letters? Well, Yod, that's a hand of creation. What did he build in the creation? Science is trying to determine what did he build. So if I look at frequency, resonance, chemistry, physics, mathematics, that's looking at the Yod stuff. 
What did he bake? What did he build? Fractal patterns, Greek letter phi, the golden mean. That's the way things are built. What's hay? Hay is an expression to reveal something, to tell us something, to, well, the Torah is the hay. The Torah is the creator's telling us what to do and how it works, how what works, what he built. So the Yod is the hand of the creator. Zerah, Zion Resh Ayan, is, is the hand of the sower who throws out and scatters seed. He scattered Israel across the face of the earth, but he said he was going to gather us back. It hasn't happened yet. Could be in the process, I think, of coming back to this language, as we've said before, that the Jews even say it's the language which holds all Judaism together, all the Jews together, all of Israel is together, is held by the language. And if right now the language is coming back into fruition, like out of the grave, pays Adi, mouth explodes, open mouth, is that that's the blossoming of the language. Well, that's just now happening. So this can't be the end of the world. It'd be crazy for this to be the end of the world. For him to have the rapture now and take us all out of here and fly us up into some other dimension, it's like, <laughs> this is a... This is a golden opportunity right now for the language coming back as people to, to come back alert out of their coma and to say, hey, who is Yahweh, our Elohim, and what should we be doing? Well, it's about this language stuff. And everything that I can see in the scripture, the language is keyed to Yeshua, Yahusha being the Mashiach. So if the Jews keep holding that, that he's an infidel and a crazy guy, they can be against the Christian Jesus who said, we're not under the law. We're under grace. We can sin all we want. Thank you, Martin Luther. No, we're not. So the Jews are right to protest that, but they're not right to protest this. This would have to be the truth. If the Ruach and the Torah have to be identical, if the Yod is the hand of the creator, what did he build? What did he make? What is, how is the universe composed? And if the hay is the declaration of the Torah saying, I'll tell you what it is. I'll tell you, Israel. I'm not telling everybody else. They're all wrong. They've got Elohim, Achim, other gods, other theories. But I'll tell you, Israel, there's no other Elohim. There's no other Ode Zulti. This is it. Though it's despised, this is where it is. The Vav, then the sixth letter, the man, the connector, that's Yeshua. The Vav man right there in his name. And then the hay he says, I'm not going to leave you alone. I'm going to give you the Ruach to lead you to the truth. Well, what's the Ruach? The mind, the soul, the, the, the disposition to the space between two things? Well, if the mind of Elohim is the Ruach of Elohim, the Ruach HaKodesh, if that's the mind, the heart, the expression of Elohim, if that's in the Ruach, that second hay of yod hay vav hay or Aleph, Hey, Yod, Hey, is identical with the first Hey. So the Torah and the Ruach can't disagree. They've, they're identical. They're both the letter Hey. So anybody who says it's either law or grace, if the spirit of grace is the Holy Spirit, and it's counter or opposite or different than the Torah, then that's kind of being a schizoid, not a chad. And so for him to say Yahweh Echad, that's what we need to hear. Singular, uni, mono, sharp pointed, uh, uh, just the thinnest, no, no other stuff. Elohim Echad is a statement of, of the bearing, the, 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 the everything, like if you have a capstan rope on a ship, and you're pulling against this, this one thing of bearing that the wheel turns around that it's constantly true, never mixed confusion. Anything mixed, anything confused, anything. See, the word for mixture is a rev. So in the evening, you got to have light and you have dark, and then it blends together. Like an airbrush blending where you can't tell one from the other. That's the word a rev, spelled ayin resh bet. Interestingly enough, it also means soiree or to be socially well mixed. You go to a party and you just talk to a bunch of people. Or like a swarm of insects where you can't tell one from the other. Just everything is blended. You can't tell one from the other. That's the word a rev. So this is 
light, this is dark, this is day, this is night, but the Arev is a blending where, which one is it? It's some degree of gray where we get the word gradient or a gradual, grad, grade, gradual, what grade are you in? How do you note the phase, like the phasing of the moon? Getting to the Rosh, the epitome of the fullness or the completely dark, the gradient is the, I'm, I'm just saying that's where these words come from. Well, the word Arab, Arab is I and Resh bent. That's gradient. If you change the letters to I and bet Resh, it's where you get the word Hebrew, Eber. Hebrew means to cross over. Hebrew means to be pregnant. You either are or you're not. If you are, that's Hebrew. So in other words, it's just an interesting look. I'm not saying that Arabs are bad and Hebrews are good. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is that the concept of blending so that you can't tell the difference is the word that became Arab in English, ayin resh bet. And ayin bet resh is the word that became eber, evrit, which means it's either the one thing or the other thing. If we're studying and trying to figure things out, we look at the thing which is confusing, which is like, oh, I can't make any sense out of this. Well, how do you make sense out of it if it's Arab? Well, you start making classifications. Like if you have a whole deck of cards and they're all jumbled up, separating them according to suits, according to colors, according to face value, number value. You, you, you just pick some standard of a way to organize. That's what the human brain does. Okay, now you can look at it and start drawing conclusions or, or, or noticing similarities. That's the process of doing Ayn Resh Kof, Eric, as in erectology, as in Eureka, I found it, as in to prepare, compare, to set a table. Knives and forks go on one side or the other with the spoons and everything placed at a certain number of degrees if you set a perfect banquet table. To say he's prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies. It's like, really, what are we eating? Oh, boy, I'm hungry. Let's have something. Is that what he's talking about? To prepare a table in front of us. Well, that's like telling us what these things mean. That is the action. The word table is shulchan, shin lamed. I think it's Het Noon. Might be Kaf Noon. But anyway, Het Noon is the word for grace. Shul Khan is sitting at the table and explaining everything. And right in the middle of being in our the dominion of our enemies, changing the words, changing the time, changing the seasons, changing the definitions. And he says, look, I've, I've laid it all out right here. Well, that's this stuff. A synonym with Reshket Bet Rechav, wide, broad, spacious, roomy, not only is wor the word ruach, but it's also peitav, which is to spread out or open. So again, here, just as uh, we're getting near the end here, but the uh, the idea of what is the benefit of Yahusha's crucifixion? I could tell you doctrine. I could read Paul's letters. It looks like it's saying, let's, like the Romans or the Jews said, let's beat the bejesus out of Jesus. So we, so all humans can sin without consequence, without repercussions. So the Christians can believe the story and suddenly there's no law, no guilt, no blame, shame, nothing's bad. That's not true. Let's beat the bejesus out of Jesus so that we can all sin. That's, that's a distortion, but that's what's taught. And if it's not taught in your church, it's taught in that other one down the street, which is why you don't go to that other one down the street. I can tell you that's what they teach because I've heard people tell me so. I've heard it.
if Yeshua actually said, listen, you guys are so far gone. I'm going to capture, recapture what was lost by the first Adam. By the first Adam who brought sin and death into the essence of being Adam. I'm going to do another Adam thing. I'm going to bring life into Adam. How do you do that? Well, it's got to be in the 22 letters. So that, that whole study of how do you read the 22 letters and find out what he did and what does that mean? It's in the 22 letters. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced. That's another matter. But, the, but the, the question is, if that was so fundamental to everything going on on the face of the earth, what Yahusha came to do, that he played out the narrative of the 22 letters, then without him, we can't know the 22 letters. So the Ayin Dalit, Ayin Tav, comprehend the door, comprehend the meaning of the letters. I, I'm convinced that that's the key to the code. Ayin Dalit, Ayin Tav, until the time. Ayin Dalit is witness testimony until. Ayin Tav means time, but also means comprehend the meaning of the letters, comprehend the signs, the Tav, the, what is the covenant? What is the door? What is the covenant? What is Yahweh looking for? What is he waiting for? What a, what's the... What is the moment? What is the action at the moment by which everything becomes different? It's kind of like the what's the point of transition in an hourglass, but where the stuff here becomes the stuff there. One one other matter in consideration of this, Revelation chapter 7, verse 2, it says that this angel comes with the seal of the living Elohim. Well, living is the word Chet Yod. Elohim, like I said, can be Aleph Lamed, Al Chai. What is the seal of the living Elohim? The word for signet ring, chet, tav, mem, aleph, seal or signature, chet, vav, tav, mem, induced to subscribe to a newspaper, hey, chet, tav, yod, mem, the authorized underwriter, chet, tav, mem. Chet, tav as a word, terror, fear, one, singular, related to Aleph Chet Tav, which is related to Aleph Chet Dalit, which is that oneness singular, so that the, the getting rid of all the other stuff and down to the singularity, but it also means to rake up coals or a bumpy air flight, or if you've ever been on an airplane where it drops, and it'll, yeah, not only, it, it's unnerving, but that's the word Chet Tav. The word Chet Tav, Chet Tav is also to be afraid or terrorized. Tav het tav means because of, on account of, instead of, in place of, underneath where one stands. In other words, what are you basing your belief on? What are you believe? What are you basing your identity upon? What are you believing when you say you believe? Het tav with a kaf suffix, which might mean yours, your het tav. Ket tov kof means to cut, to decide, pronounce, articulate, which is to speak, determined, and decree. So if ket tov mem, tov mem is the word for perfect, artless. I didn't add anything to it. This is the original. So to say the seal of the living Elohim, ket, ket yod, my ket, that's the word life. So the perfectness of my stuff, my kingdom, my identity, my kingdom, my signature without adding bogus entries, without drawing a mustache on the Mona Lisa, as it were, my reality, my signature without false doctrines of wayward distortions, but, well, this is the straight line between the dot and the dot of Ehie. Ehie Asher Ehye. This simple, authentic, validate, confirm, what did he give us as the expanse between the two dots? His Ruach, which is his Aleph Bet. So to look at this whole thing as a puzzle, as an equation, as it were, where's the variable? What is the Ruach? What is the truth? What is the Aleph Tav? What is the what is the straight line between Ehie and Ehie? 
whoever Ehie is, the straight line, that's who Ehie is, is this Ruach, is this Aleph Bet, is the real meaning of the letters keyed to the Moedim, validated by Yahusha's narrative story. So the Jews who forsake Yeshua are got at least one eye blind and they're missing it. The Christians who invalidate the Torah and invalidate the Moedim got the other eye blind. And even though they see Yeshua, they've turned them into some archetypal Elohim Achrim that the Jews can't go along with. Neither can the Muslims or the Hindus or Buddhists. So that's why everybody hates the Christian thing is because they can sense the wrongness. Though part of the story is correct. Yeah, but part of everybody else's story is correct too. So how do you get the real truth? That's the Chet Tov Mem. And so in Revelation 7, 2, where this guy comes and he puts the seal on the forehead, but according to the Aramaic, it's bet. Elion, it's the, it's the taught, trained, and domesticated, the bet yod tov. Bet is a condition of being of the covenant. What covenant? What did he say? I'll be your Elohim. And the people said, everything Yahweh says, we will hear and we will do. There's the covenant. So what I'm saying is that what's his word, what's his name, what's the teaching, what's the covenant, what's the, where's the life? And it seems to all, at least in my comprehension, it all boils down to who is he? Which God are you worshiping? It's the, it's the Elohim that gave us the Moedim, that gave us these words of this Aleph Bet that he aligns his identity and integrity with these 22 letters. Therefore, as I contemplate, as I study, as I navigate, as I meditate, as I ponder what these letters mean in the light of everything he said, I'm holding fast to his name and not denying belief. I'm laboring for his name's sake. I'm guarding his word and not denying his name. And I'm doing what he said, which is sitting down the Sabbath day and attending to, listening, and guarding, which is the works that he said to do as we try to help one another. That's the qualifications of the, of the things he's validating about all seven assemblies in the Book of Revelation. It's interesting that the two places where he criticizes one of the churches, Revelation 2.14 and 2.20, is he criticizes them for whoring and eating food offered to idols. Yeah, but if Jesus died on the cross to do away with the law, how could he then criticize churches 60 years later for doing two things that are against the law. See, something doesn't add up. Yeshua was crucified around 30 AD CE, and the book of Revelation was written about 90. So 60 years after he died on the cross, he criticizes the churches for, or the assemblies in Revelation 2 for pouring and eating food offered to idols. If, if you can eat whatever you want because it didn't matter, then why would he say that? And if you can behave Zion Noon, we talked about that last week. The word Zion Noon is the word for harlot, Zion Noon Hay, but it's also to feed and give accommodations, to give nourishment. There's a bed and breakfast at an inn, at a hotel. So they translated it as the word for whoring. And he, com- and he, and he, uh, and he criticized Israel repeatedly, especially in the book of Hosea, which we'll have to deal with next week about go marry a a harlot and uh, name the children that you get these three different names. But if that's giving something to eat and giving accommodations, then when he said, eat my flesh and drink my blood, it's kind of like the whole same thing. He is giving to eat. He is acting as the one nourishing and saying, here, dwell with, dwell, dwell in my place. So what I'm suggesting is this thing that called the spirit of harlotry 
and this thing that he was condemning in the churches in Revelation 2.14 and 2.20 is actually changing what he said. Very specifically, Zion noon. In other, in other words, instead of the Zion being the seventh day of this is the Kadosh day, well, change it. Do this, noon. No, do something different. So every word of change, this is my body and blood. We're going to give you a ritual of liturgy, of worship, that Jesus instituted on Passover at the Last Supper, and it's going to contradict what Yahuwah said to do. I'm Kadosh, you're to be Kadosh. I rested on the seventh day. Israel, you're to rest on the seventh day. I told you these are not food, so Israel, don't eat those things. Oh, but if we if we take the Eucharist, the communion, and claim the body and blood of Jesus, we can eat anything we want, and we don't have to rest on any particular day. That's Zion Noon Hay in the name of Zion Noon. In the name of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, we're going to turn it into a reveling with whores. Is that what's going on? Is that the Eucharist? I know some people would be horribly offended at what I'm saying. I'm just trying to say what's going on. Because if the Elohim of Revelation 7, those people that say our Elohim rules and reigns, we are his people, he has granted us salvation. The robes they are wearing is to indicate they were on the right track, the right page, the right heart, the right frame of mind, which according to the words, heart, soul, and strength is all the same, which is to have an intensive effort to elucidate the truth based on his word and his name. It's all an achad, his word, his name, his truth, his Aleph Tav, his Aleph Bet, his Mashiach is all a singular echadness. And if anything's different, it's not true. Should probably end there. We'll get into Hosea, how that plays into comparing Hosea with the uh, Aleph Tav uh, next week. What I'm saying again. The argument of law versus grace is a complete distraction as to there is no argument between law and grace. It's a fake. Don't be undone by it. Trying to bleed our energy away, which was the action of the fourth beast, the monster there in Daniel chapter seven, the fourth beast wore out, exhausted the saints. Kadoshim Elohim, how? With Chewing up, she, the word teeth is shinun, which means to change. So to chew up by changing words, stomped with his feet what remains. The word for regal is feet and leg, which is custom, habit, and tradition. So chewing up, changing the meaning of words, and imposing other custom, habit, and tradition, he exhausted or depleted the energy, the attention, the, the efforts of the kadoshim, the saints, kadoshim elionin, doesn't say he prevailed over them by killing them. So it's like if we're going to protect our energy expense, well, you can throw it into a sinkhole there in the, the Internet or TV. But wow, if you if you could preserve your energy and use it and, and expend it for good rather than expend it for loss. Just a consideration. Anyway, we should be at the end of the talk here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise thee, Father, for thy word is true. We we are so thankful and so so amazingly, Father, just overwhelmed with the with the knowledge, finding out that yes, thou art an L whose yes is yes and whose no is no, where there is no division, what thou says is. Thou art not double minded, thou art not mixed. Thou art echad. We ask Abba that thou would fill us with the same ruach, thine ruach, as thy word said, that we may be one with thee. 
Amen. Amen.